Welcome everyone. I am Ari Ingle, the Director of Creative Community for Peace. It's a pleasure to have everyone joining us today once again from around the world. Uh, Creative Community for Peace is a nonprofit entertainment industry organization comprised of prominent members of the entertainment community who have come together to promote the arts as a bridge to peace, to counter anti-Semitism within the entertainment industry, and also galvanize support against the cultural boycott of Israel. To learn our bar about our work and to please support our work, visit ccfpeace.com, that is ccfpeace.com or creativecommunityforpeace.com. We're glad to have all of you with us today, once again, in our public square and joining us for this installment of our Dispelling the Myth series, which is an educational series of conversations with some of the leading experts on the issues and challenges facing Israel and the Jewish people today. If you missed any of our previous conversations, they can be found on our podcast and our YouTube page. Please just visit our website, for those links. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the anti-Jewish campaign of Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, as well as some of the historical roots of anti-Semitism in America that led to this. Please feel free to leave questions in the Q&A section of the chat, and I'll try to get to as many of them as possible uh, towards the end of the discussion. We ask that you just please leave uh, questions in the Q&A section only, not comments. All other comments can always be emailed to us at info at creativecommunityforpeace.com. That is info at creativecommunityforpeace.com. And we're always happy to answer any uh, feedback or ideas or opinions you may have. Uh, in conversation with me today is Aaron Breitbart, who is the senior researcher at the Simon Wiesenthal Center here in Los Angeles. The Simon Wiesenthal Center is a Jewish global human rights organization researching the Holocaust and hate in a historic and contemporary context. The center confronts anti-Semitism, hate, and terrorism, promotes human rights and dignity, stands with Israel, and defends the safety of Jews worldwide. Aaron received his degree in the history from Yeshiva University and helped research and write the Salmon Wiesenthal Center report, Louis Farrakhan, Four Decades of Bigotry, in his own words. Welcome, Aaron. Well, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be on with you. Great. Well, thank you for being here. This is a very important topic. Uh, we know we've had a lot of conversations about Israel, and this is really turning back to America to discuss an issue that has been uh, very, uh, you know, important to the Jewish community for now decades. Um, so just to, just to start to set the table here, uh, I want to start with some of the historical roots of anti-Semitism in the Black community in America before Farrakhan, in the early days of America, um, and in the 1800s. Where, were, where did that come from? What were some of the reasons why anti-Semitism started to fester? Well, you know, it's a very interesting question because uh, in the slavery period of staying on America, the American Jewish community, such as it was at that time, was very pro-abolitionist. They were anti-slavery. Blacks identified with the Jews, you had slaves singing, you know, go down Moses. They thought that they were sort of in the same situation as the Israelites several thousand years before. Right. And uh, later on, you'll find a lot of churches called Zion Church. Well, that Zion was uh, a uh, result of uh, the admiration of Zionism that the Jewish people had at that time. Uh, the idea of being free, having their ho own homeland. The Blacks looked upon Jews as basically uh, fellow sufferers. And the fact of the matter is that the, the Jew had uh, been a subject of scorn uh, in, the U in the United States, even long before there was the United States. When the first Jews arrived in New York in 1654, right. uh, they were met with a, a great amount of contempt. Uh, it seemed as though later on, things began to change, however. Uh, and uh, after the war, you had a lot of Jewish peddlers, uh, a lot of Jewish store owners. You had some who were actually landlords or worked for landlords collecting the rent. Uh, some were employers of Blacks. Uh, and that's when a certain amount of conflict began. There was always a, a period of of conflict combined with cooperation between Jews and Blacks. Uh, many whites would simply have nothing to do with Blacks, while Jews felt very, very uh, sorry for what had happened to Blacks. Blacks. And if you take a look in all the Jewish, the Yiddish papers of the time, you will see that there was a, a tremendous amount of, of feeling for them. Nevertheless, when your landlord or your employer or your, your uh, merchant 
uh, is a Jew and you may not be happy with him for some reason or another, a certain amount of conflict is, is going to begin. And, and that started in the late 1800s uh, and it festered into the 1900s, especially when Jews were, were granted the privileges of whiteness right. by, by the Anglo population already in the country. And they took advantage of that to, uh, to essentially improve their lot. Blacks, of course, couldn't, could not take advantage of whiteness. And, and that was also part of the conflict. A certain amount of jealousy right. was involved. Right. James Baldwin, I think he described in his essay, Blacks are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white. I think he was talking about this sort of friction there that existed in Brooklyn as, you know, white people became, uh, you know, they started as immigrants, uh, were able, as you said, sort of take advantage of some of the, the liberties that America offered that maybe some of the Black community weren't able to, you know, take advantage of. Um, That's correct. So, and, but there was also areas of cooperation, right? There was the Rosenwald schools, there was the co-founding of the NAACP. So maybe talk about a little bit about that cooperation as well. Yes, well, the Rosenwald School Project was established during the First World War in 1917. One has to understand what the nature of, of education was to Blacks, especially in the South at that time. It was underfunded. Uh, the schools were inferior, if there were any at all. And uh, Rosenwald, Julius Rosenwald, decided to fund the project, which would establish schools and other centers of learning for Black children. As a matter of fact, one third of all Black children living in the South were beneficiaries of the school system. And it worked essentially as not as simply a handout, but whatever the, the Black community could raise and the white community could raise, the Rosenwald uh, Foundation would match. And uh, some of those schools were, were unbelievable. Uh, a very important uh, issue regarding uh, Black, uh, Jewish and, uh, and Black cooperation. As a matter of fact, Booker T. Washington, uh, who was the first president of Tuskegee, uh, was a very close friend of Rosenwald and uh, Rosenwald eventually sat on the board of, of Tuskegee uh, University. Interestingly enough, a lot of the schools that Rosenwald started are still up and they're national monuments today. Wow. I mean, yeah, it, and, and as well as, as I mentioned, the co-founding the NAACP and really helping to fight and champion, uh, you know, for Black rights in America when uh, there was a lot of tension still at the turn of the century there in the 1900s. So, you know, let's, let's turn a little bit to the nation of Islam itself. Um, when was it founded and uh, who founded it and, and why was it founded? You know, it, was, it wasn't looking to be an equal rights movement. It was more of a black supremacist movement, correct? At the very least, a, a black nationalist movement, uh, which tried to combine certain uh, points of Islam with Black nationalism. It was founded uh, about 1930, maybe in 1930 itself. Uh, it promoted racial unity, self-help, a strict code of discipline. Timothy Drew, uh, the noble Drew Ali, uh, started with a, uh, a Moorish science temple in Newark, New Jersey. He published the Holy Quran for members of his congregation and for others. Uh, which actually had very little to do with the actual Quran. As a matter of fact, when one reads it, one can see that Timothy um, Drew was really not knowledgeable of the Quran. After him, however, came Wallace Ford. And uh, Wallace Ford actually claimed to be uh, Drew incarnate. And he started a temple of Islam in Detroit. Uh, Ford eventually wound up uh, descending into, into uh, uh, obscurity, but he had uh, a, uh, a person helping him named Elijah Poole, who became later known as Elijah Mohammed. Right. And he started a temple in Chicago, and uh, he eventually took over the movement altogether. 
Uh, he taught a very interesting myth. Uh, one was that God was black and had created man to be black, but an evil scientist named Yakub uh, created the white man by killing black babies. And uh, a very strange, interesting idea. And of course, Farrakhan, uh, you know, subscribed to that as well. Um, he also believed that the time was up for the white man in 1914 and that, uh, you know, a certain amount of revenge would be taken upon them for all the black bad things that have been done to black America. He also believed that blacks should drop their slave names and uh, at least put an X at the end of their name to show that I don't know what my original name was, but I'm not gonna be called Smith or Jones or what have you anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Muhammad Ali, I mean, uh, Elijah Muhammad mm -hmm. died in 1975 and he appointed his son, Warid, to, uh, to take over. And that of course caused a certain amount of anger, especially on the part of a, a man that had been recruited by Malcolm X in the 50s to join the movement. And his name was Louis, became known as, as Louis Farrakhan. Right. So what was the nation of Islam always anti-Semitic in nature before Farrakhan? Like what was their position on Jews and on, on Israel at that time? Well, they had a problem, first of all, with whites. And Elijah Muhammad had no problem criticizing Jews but he criticized them no more than other whites. He criticized them as being white. Uh, I cannot say that he himself uh, was an anti-Semite. At least uh, he did not uh, put his, any anti-Semitism he may have had into, uh, into rhetoric. Uh, but I would say that it was uh, Farrakhan who, uh, who took the nation of Islam and turned it into an, a perpetuator of anti-Semitism. Uh, clearly so. Before, not too much. But, uh, and if there was, it was because Jews were white and whites were problems and problematic. But it was Farrakhan who not only broke away, but eventually took over the movement altogether. And that's when the trouble started. Right. So, you know, we actually... Uh, arriving late, but we have him here with us is uh, Dumasani Washington, who is uh, the founder and CEO of the Institute of Black Solidarity with Israel. Dumasani is a pastor, professional musician, graduate of the San Francisco Conservative Music, and author whose latest book is the second edition of Zionism in the Black Church. So we're going to welcome in him as well, who's going to be joining us for part of this conversation. So Dumasani, are you there with us now? Uh, Ari, I'm here, but I'm uh, in transit, so I just That's landed fine. in D.C., uh, so I can hear, I'm trying to just listen to everything, and I'll, when I get a better Sure, you feel free to chime in at any point. You can turn your video off, but if you have anything to add, you uh, know, feel free to jump in. Okay, so we'll continue on, and once again, if you have anything to add, Dumasani, you don't have to have your video on, you can just feel free to jump in. Um, so, so going back, Aaron, uh, where did Farrakhan come from? Like, what is his background? How did he become the Nation of Islam leader? Well, he was born in uh, 1933 in the Bronx as uh, uh, Louis Eugene Walcott. Um, basically led the Nation of Islam since 78. Uh, he was raised by his mother, uh, who was from the islands. I believe it was St. Kitts. Um, he was quite religious as a boy. He was active uh, in an Episcopal church in Boston, uh, graduated with honors. He's a very bright young man, showed a lot of promise. He played violin, and at the same time, he was also on the school's track team. Uh, he went to school, uh, to, to university, but dropped out, and he pursued a career at the time in the Boston nightclubs as, as a Calypso singer. He's known as Calypso Jean. Uh, married a woman in Khadija, had nine children. And, um, you know, he, uh, he after, you know, Malcolm X broke with that uh, nation of Islam as he became a little bit more of a, of a Sunni Muslim. And uh, 
Farrakhan was a very brilliant man, and he was able to uh, to take over the group and uh, became known really to Jews in about 1984 during the uh, uh, the, the the Jesse Jackson era and the presidential the campaign. Election. Yes, uh, and that's when I don't know if some, something snapped or that's the time that uh, he something happened in him that that he or that he said you know he always had the animus and now decided he could voice it and make political hay out of it right so i want to play like a, a little clip of some of the statements of farrakhan and then we'll talk a little bit more about this transition in him so let me uh, share this real quick and um here we go the satanic jews They control everything and mostly everybody. You are not the chosen of God. You are the chosen of Satan. I'm talking about the wicked ones on, in the Jewish community that run America, run the government, run the world, own the banks, own the, the means of communication. They are my enemies. When they talk about Farrakhan, call me a hater. You know what they do? Call me an anti-Semite. Stop it. I'm anti-termite. These Jews were at the root of what you call the Holocaust. There were many Israelis and Zionist Jews in key roles in the 9-11 attacks. Those of you that say that you are Jews, I will not even give you the honor of calling you a Jew. You're not a Jew. You're so-called. You're Satan. And it's my job now to pull the cover off of Satan so that every Muslim when he sees Satan, yes, sir. pick up a stone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So there we have uh, Mr. Farrakhan in his own words. So, so getting back to it, when did he start singling out Jews, and and where does this where does that stem from? Was it this relationship with Jesse Jackson, um, the really turning point here? Well, it seems as that's when the trouble started. Uh, I, I want to say, first of all, that Jesse Jackson and Louis Farrakhan really don't have much in common, even though Farrakhan supported him and uh, was willing to, uh, to give Jesse Jackson uh, some of the, the food of Islam, the young people who, would, uh, who were his guards to, to protect Jackson. But we, we, that all started, and uh, Jackson made that unfortunate comment you know, about Jaime's and Jaime Town. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, Jackson later on uh, condemned remarks that had been made by Farrakhan, said that they were divisive, they were morally reprehensible. So I, I don't even want to put both of them in the same, uh, the same right. category. They're very different people altogether. So where did, this, where did this hatred come from then from Louis Farrakhan? Like what, what started that fixation on Jews? You know, it's a very interesting question. In 1942, Ralph Bunch, Dr. Ralph Bunch, who was head of the policy department at Harvard and, and later known for even greater things, said that the Jew had always been an easy target, an easy scapegoat. And uh, he was right. The fact of the matter is that uh, it's hard to say exactly what it is that ignites hatred in someone else. Uh, people coming to the center ask me when I, I uh, give lectures, uh, what made Hitler hate Jews so much? And they are so, and the fact of the matter is, it's a very good question, except for the fact that people assume that Hitler was the worst anti-Semite that lived, or that Farrakhan is the worst anti-Semite today. Uh, it may be true, but the fact of the matter is, that uh, there are plenty of people who felt like the two of them who were just simply not able to do what they wanted to do. And so we forget about them. Uh, what makes a person a Jew hater? It's hard to say. Uh, you know, 
uh, Baldwin in his famous essay wrote that it was very difficult for a black person to see uh, a Jew as his, uh, as his merchant charging perhaps too much for uh, goods for that may not have been the best goods. And yet this person leaves you know, the neighborhood and then goes home to a much nicer neighborhood. So there's a certain amount of jealousy there. And uh, Hitler also may have felt uh, you know, a certain amount of jealousy uh, towards Jews. But it's hard to know exactly what it is. But jealousy is a good place to start. Right. Uh, I think uh, that Favikan may have grown up seeing the, the Jew being more upwardly mobile. You know, in America, there were two lessons, one learned by Jews and one learned by Blacks. The lesson learned by Jews is if you get a good education, you're a good worker, you can be upwardly mobile, you can be doctors and professors and politicians and everything else. Right. Blacks did not have that lesson. Their lesson was that in this country, no matter what you do, the legacy of racism is going to affect you and it is going to keep you down. Because right. Blacks did not have the one thing that Jews had going for them racially. Jews were white and they took advantage, let's face it. Many of them tried to out white whites, but Blacks did not have that advantage. And so there was obviously a certain amount of resentment uh, that, would, that would take place. And I don't condone it, of course, but I can understand why a person might think that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Farrakhan has, is resentment towards Jews, not only Jews in America, but Jews thousands of miles away from him, those in Israel. Uh, what does he have to do with Israel? What has, it, is, what has the Israelis ever done to him? Or, you know, the fact is nothing, but that hatred is there. It may be largely based on jealousy. It's hard to tell what is in a person's heart, but right. clearly there is a very dark spot, spot in his heart for whites in general and for Jews in particular. Right. And, you know, he seems to be almost infatuated with Hitler. He, he brings, uh, he's praised Hitler. Um, uh, he said he was, you know, the proud of, you know, almost like proud of Hitler, called him a great man. And this is almost like KKK language, you know, praising Hitler. And he also, you know, takes up the line, which is really interesting because, you know, the nation of Islam is supposed to be based on Islam, but he, he often repeats sort of like the, the, the Christian line that Jews killed Jesus. And, you know, so, you know, what is this sort of like fixation on, on Hitler? And, and why is he not seen as someone like the, a member of the KKK in America? Why is he not seen in that regard? Well, because he's not white. And right. therefore, he's considered a member of a, uh, of a class, of a group of people that are repressed, that are suppressed, they are discriminated against. And so therefore, uh, they assume he cannot be a racist because his people are not in power. Uh, what he does not understand or wish to understand is that if Hitler had his way, he and his children, and millions of Blacks in this country would not be around today. Uh, had Hitler won the war and had, he, had decided to try to take over the world, which he, he might have very well done. Uh, he was actually willing to overlook the fact that Hitler looked upon Black people near the very bottom of the, of the human totem pole, right. basically as, as intervention, as, as uh, a lower type of humanity. Uh, he overlooked that so much because of his hatred of Jews. I believe that he hates Jews more than he cares about Blacks. Right, right, right. And, you know, the, so the, the Nation of Islam Mosque, they eventually sold copies of the Protocols of Elders of Zion, um, the International Jew, a history of Jewish crime. But their 1991 book, the secret relationship between Blacks and Jews was really a game changer in his hatred towards Jews. Can you just tell us a little bit about this book? And, and this is a publication, Dr. Henry Gates, head of the African-American Studies Department in Harvard, called one of the most sophisticated hate literatures ever compiled. Well, no doubt about it. Uh, 
Farrakhan used sources of questionable reliability, uh, and that's being very charitable towards them. Among other things, Farrakhan argued that Jews were the primary force behind slavery in North America. Uh, Jewish slave traders, what have you. The fact of the matter is, it's not true at all. Jews were maybe two and a half percent of the slave trade in this country, which obviously was two and a half percent too much. They were not active slave traders, but they sort of, uh, as you may say, greased the wheels. For example, there were ships in, uh, in Rhode Island that were owned by Jews, and if slave traders wanted to hire those ships to rent them out, you know, Jews let them have that. There were some Jews who may have had slaves. Uh, those Jews were not really plantation owners in the South at, at that time or any time. They were, you know, they were peddlers, some of the more successful ones opened shops. And even in the North, where there were Black house slaves, uh, Jews, for the most part, uh, wanted to have uh, white servants in the house. Most Jews were, were very, very anti-slavery. After all, one of the most important Jewish holidays is Passover, recalling the bitterness of slavery. Right. And, uh, you know, to argue that Jews were behind the slave trade is, is very unfair. As a matter of fact, there were more Blacks behind the slave trade, especially um, those who sold slaves uh, to to, the, to North African Muslims, and then they were sent to this country. It was a very ugly event, a very ugly stain on America. But to say that Jews were major players in the slave industry, if you want to call it that, is an, an insult not to, to Jews, but, but to history. It's, it's a sheer lie, and it has been condemned by the American Historical Association, by Seymour Drescher as a lie. Henry Louis Gates basically said that um, it's a new Bible of anti-Semitism. And one of the greatest scholars involving slavery in the, the United States, Eugene Genovese, who died in, uh, not that long ago, said that it's, uh, its scholarship was, was very, very questionable and that its viciousness was nothing more than an attempt to foam hatred against Jews. Right, right. And just to put some numbers for people listening, um, in, in 1790, there were around 700,000 slaves in America, 209 were owned by Jews, which is 0.003%. Um, as you say, any slaves owned is, is one too many. And then 1820, when there was 1.5 million slaves in America, there was 700 owned by Jews, which is 0.004%. So just to put it in perspective of what the real numbers are, not that once again, any numbers uh, are good, but to claim that the Jews actually controlled the slave trade is, uh, I mean, pure Jew hatred. Um, yeah, absolutely pure Jew, Jew hatred. So, you know, how was he able to build up such a big following then? Like, what is what is the actual size of this following? And, um, you know, you know, how, wh why was this message connecting with so many people? Well, one also has to understand that um, that uh, the Nation of Islam is not only an organization of hate. They do valuable things in the community. There are, there are AIDS clinics, um, all kinds of, of, of social agencies that they sponsor, and those have done some good to the, for the Black community in Chicago. And so he has a certain cadre, a group of people, actually, who have seen what he has done. Um, <clears throat> so much so that politicians in the Chicago area are very much afraid to criticize him, much less condemn him, because they know it's going to cost them votes. So right. uh, they generally stay clear from that. But Farrakhan's organization has given Blacks a certain amount of, uh, of help within the community. He has given them a certain amount of, uh, of self-respect in the community. Uh, 
and so to say that he has done no good uh, for the for the community at large would be a mistake. Very much, you know, Hamas does a lot of social work in the areas that it controls, uh, right. including the clinics, etc., social agencies. So uh, that otherwise, people would say, if all this person does is spew hate. What do we get out of him? Why should we follow him? Why do the people suck it up? Because Farrakhan has given some a certain amount of self-respect. He speaks about the importance of, of getting education, of, of self-respect, of social responsibility, of discipline, of uh, economic um, independence. So those things do sit well. Uh, similarly, Adolf Hitler, his program uh, was not simply anti-Semitic. If that's all it were, he would not have risen to the position in Germany that he did. So right. you take advantage of people's uh, situation, and that is the perfect time for a demagogue. They come out of the walls, out of the woodwork like roaches. And right. this is what happens. If the situation is right, You'll be surprised how many people take advantage of it and how many people are, are fooled into believing it. I'd like to ask, say one interesting thing. At one of his speeches, you know, Farrakhan claimed that the Jews seem to have a control of medicine and of law. And he asked his people, the people there, how many of you here are lawyers and doctors? And there was nobody who answered. And he used that as an argument to say that he was right. I use it as an argument to say that intelligent and educated black people are the kind of people that would not go to that right. kind of, of, of speech and listen to that kind of man. And, and I believe that is the case. Right. I think I think you're definitely right there. You know, and I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, Hezbollah, which we're talking about next week in this discussion, they've done a lot of the same thing while they're waging war against Israel. They provide a lot of the social services to people there that are not being provided by the state. And I think a lot of people always, you know, I think get get frustrated um, when you'll see, you know, certain artists that are Christian supporting Farrakhan or, or speaking well of Farrakhan and wondering why they're doing that. And I think because when you grew up in the inner city, as you're talking about, the Nation of Islam shows up, they provide those social services, they provide, you know, try to clean the streets from drugs and crime when, uh, you know, other people are not doing that. And whether they're members of the Nation of Islam or not, they, they see them in a positive light. And I don't think they really understand uh, the effect, you know, those words and the Farrakhan's words have on um, on the Jewish community. But it's almost staying in, in sort of, I guess, the Middle East there, what are his views on Israel? Well, his view is that Israel doesn't belong there, that the Israelis are not the, uh, the descendants of the ancient Israelites who were there 3,000 years before, that the Israelis are uh are exploiters and and uh uh of the palestinians and uh he said that israel was founded by a a law with a zionist uh agreement with the nazis just about anything you can say bad and one thing i would like to add don't think that these comments and others made by lewis farrakhan hurt just Jews. They do hurt Jews. They also hurt the people who hear them because it poisons their hearts. It poisons their minds. And uh, I've got to tell you, it must be very, very painful to have to hate like that and to convince others to do the same. Right. You know, and he calls Jews, you know, so-called and frauds and, and the synagogue of Satan. Um, and then he has to pull, as we saw in that clip, pull the, the cover off of Satan. You know, so what does he what does he mean when he says the synagogue is Satan? Do you, do you know what he's really referring to there? Is, well, is he just referring to simply that Jews are not the real Jews? Well, it's more than that. It's basically a takeoff on a New Testament source, which says that the, you people may call yourself Jews, but you don't behave like Jews. Instead, you're the synagogue of the devil. In other words, saying that the Jews that are not good Jews, you know, are bad Jews. Uh, there are a lot of Jews who may feel the same way, but the synagogue of Satan business is the way he uses it is that it seems as though every synagogue is satanic by its nature, uh, which explains perhaps why he refers to Judaism 
as a gutter religion. Um, he, he contradicts himself saying, I'm not talking about the good Jews, the ones who observe the commandments and act according, accordingly. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, he also said in general that, uh, that, that, that Judaism not only is a gutter religion, it's based on lies. Uh, so he contradicts himself. Now, people who follow him very carefully and read his speeches uh, can see those contradictions. And clearly, uh, he, he has an agenda on his, on his mind that is pernicious, that is vicious, uh, that is uh, very cunning. And people are willing to believe some things. In other words, if you say five bad things and you say three good things, people will say, well, I'm interested in really the good things that he says. And uh, yeah, I don't really agree with the bad things or the anti-Semitic things he says, but I got news for you. Once you start listening to a person uh, and you hear the same thing over and over again, Jews control the banks, Jews control the Federal Reserve, Jews control Hollywood, Jews control just about, Jews control the black president, Obama, right. Jews control, you know, the civil rights movement. Uh, you know, you're wondering what's with this guy. Everywhere he looks, he sees a Jew. Right. And, uh, you know, that, that is, that's problematic because he reinforces prejudices that other people might have, and he allows them to come out. They become respectable now. Anti-Semitism has become quite respectable. You, if a white preacher said those things about Black people, you would hear the greatest explosion. Right, people take it to the streets. Right. But because Farrakhan says it, and Farrakhan is a member of a, of a, uh, uh, of a, of a group that has not reached actual equality with everybody else, people let him get it away with it. Right. That's wrong. Right, right. Hate is hate. And, and, you know, Jews react to his statements. And this is said to be one reason why he targets Jews, because it elicits this strong response and then it gets press. So what is the right response to this from the Jewish community? Well, I've always believed, and I think others believe, that education is key and that the Jewish community has to go out and not only complain about Mr. Farrakhan, but teach people who don't know about Jews right. why Farrakhan is wrong, why Jews and Blacks had a strong relationship and should continue to have a strong, an even stronger relationship in the future because both of them have very important mutual interests and they should not allow anybody to, to be divisive, to to cause Blacks and Jews to be further divided. The history of Jews and Blacks in this country has been one of cooperation and at the same time tension. This should not uh, be allowed to, to simply continue in forms of, of tension. Of course, there are tensions. Uh, there are tensions between all kinds of groups. Farrakhan doesn't like the Chinese either. In one speech, he imitated the Chinese. He doesn't like the Koreans who came in and took over the stores when the Jewish people left. Uh, he doesn't like lots of people. I have personally found that bigots are genuine, genuinely and generally uh, equal opportunity haters. But Jews have to go out and, and talk to the black community. They have to make that extra effort. The leadership of both communities has to understand that one community Put it against another community is in nobody's interest except right. the haters. Right. We cannot allow hatred to take over this country. Right. Especially two persecuted, historically persecuted communities like the Black community in America and the Jewish community. Um, and I think I think you're onto something there. Where you know we started at Creative Community for Peace, this Black along with some other partners, a Black Jewish Entertainment Alliance from the entertainment industry, and to really work with the entertainment industry to to sort of build those bridges and learn about anti-Semitism, learn about racism, so we can counter this stuff. And I think, 
the Jewish community does, it's very easy to react to a lot of this hatred that he spews. And I think sometimes uh, overreaction just amplifies his message. And I think he's very uh, acute at understanding that. Um, you know, so just to get in a couple more questions and we have some audience questions. Um, you know, he, he accuses the Jews of using Hollywood to promote gay sex, that the Jews are responsible for weed that promotes gay sex in the black community, that Jews are behind the black community, members of the black community being gay. Um, every ill in the world. Does he ever hold his own people ever to account for anything? You know, and why is it so hard for members of the black community to denounce him? Well, as I mentioned before, Farrakhan has and his organization has done certain things for the black community, especially, you know, in the Chicago area. Um, people generally don't like, uh, especially people who are right, an underprivileged group, do not like uh, taking down those who are in who have a certain amount of power, who have given others a certain amount of self-respect. Uh, sometimes they're simply afraid of them. Violence is certainly an op a, a, a something to fear here. Uh, and as far as, as uh, others are concerned, the left has always had this, uh, a, a certain propensity to leave those alone who are not in a position of power. Uh, those are who are viewed as, as being underprivileged or being suppressed or repressed. And you will find them saying, look, the Farrakhan uh, may have some views that we don't agree with, but he's never going to come to power. His people have been you know, suppressed for so long. Uh, they tend to identify almost with anybody in such a situation or presenting such a people without even looking at the moral issue, without even looking at the facts. Uh, that's not true of the moderate left. It's not true of the moderate right. But whenever you have extremes, uh, you will get that. You will find a person on the right, the far right, not wishing to to uh, come down on, on somebody who's a far right as somebody on the left may not want to do, do it with somebody on the left. So for a variety of reasons, Farrakhan has gotten away with it because people say, all right, he's nuts, but he's never coming to power. It's a small group of people, the black intelligentsia know what he's all about and right. don't want to have anything to do with him. And they are the people that we can really look forward <clears throat> to working with. Uh, not the Farrakhan's, but the truth of the matter, matter is that, uh, you know, when the SS started, those people involved in, in most of the war crimes for the Nazis, it started out with eight people, eight, basically Hitler's uh, chauffeur and his personal bodyguard when people were still throwing tomatoes at him. We cannot allow this to fester, and it will fester. And if it, and in a situation now, post COVID and economic trouble ahead, and it looks like there is, uh, this is when it becomes extremely dangerous when people are willing to listen to just about anybody who has promises to make and who also says, it's not your fault. It's, it's the fault of somebody else. You don't have to look in the mirror. You're really superior to most people. You have a situation like that, and that becomes very, very scary. It took hold in Germany, and the German people paid a price for it. I don't want anybody in this country to have to pay a terrible price because of, of some of the so-called leaders or people who consider themselves leaders who support and uh, perpetuate hatred. America is not like that. It must not... Uh, ever be allowed to become like that. As Ben Franklin once said, either we hang together or we hang separately. We may have come over on different ships to this country, but the fact is we're all in the same boat now. Right, right, that brilliantly stated. Um, so to go to a couple of audience questions, and some of this we sort of touched on, so you know, feel free to, you can keep some answers shorter than others. Um, there's been a couple of questions about, you know, why he is tolerated in progressive circles. You have people like Tamika Mallory of the Women's March called him the greatest of all time. 
Um, how does a progressive movement like the Women's March support Farrakhan, a male chauvinist? And why would any woman really support someone like this? Because they're, for the most part, far leftist. I'm not saying Stalinist. And leftists will do that. Leftists will support Cuba. They'll support Venezuela. They'll support China. They'll support, support Pakistan. They have nothing to say bad except for the United States, for Israel, for Western-style democracies. And uh, in the case of Tamika Mallory, let's face it, if you're anywhere in the Chicago area, anywhere in Illinois, you do not want to make an enemy of a person like Louis Farrakhan. Right. Very simple. Right. And here's another one that's interesting, and, and I hear him talk about this a lot. What is his obsession with the Talmud uh, being a hateful document? What's behind this? He, he brings us up all the time about the Talmud. Well, a lot of people may not know what the Talmud is, but it's basically the rabbinical interpretation uh, uh, of the five books of Moses. And uh, I studied Talmud because I, I attended yeshiva for, uh, for, high, for basically day school all the way through college at Yeshiva University. Uh, and most people don't know about the Talmud, so it's, and most people do not know how to look up a source in the Talmud. So they may find something in the Talmud, for example, and twist it around a little bit to show that, that the Talmud is, is anti-Gentile or anti-Christian, for example. The Talmud does say, make certain statements, but the Talmud made those statements against idol worshipers and pagans. Uh, not against the new Christian sect that, that developed at the time. Uh, the Talmud may say something, for example, there's a, a Jewish uh, uh, teaching that in times, uh, it says, you may kill the best Gentile. So people say, boy, that's a terrible statement to make. And it would be if one did not really so, uh, take a closer look at the source. They said, in time of war, one does not have to ask, my goodness, those people on the other side, maybe some of them are saintly, maybe some of them are good. You know, maybe I shouldn't fight them. Maybe I, I should, shouldn't shoot back. Maybe they're better human beings than I am in real life. And so the Talmud says, in time of war, you don't have to think that. You don't, it's kill or be killed. So when it's, you know, when people here kill the best of Gentiles, they say, what a horrible statement to make. Right. But it's made only for time of war where it's either you kill the enemy or they kill you. However, most people will not look up these sources. Right. And as a result of that, they'll say, aha, this is what the Talmud is saying. And that's why anti-Semites point to the Talmud because A, I'm sure they cannot read the Talmud in the original or the commentaries to the Talmud. And B, they know that nobody's going to check the source. Right, right. So selective quoting, almost like uh, his, his book we were discussing earlier, sort of taking bits and pieces and reformulating it to fit whatever narrative he's trying to push. That's what it is. Um, so what's the relationship between Farrakhan then and now, you know, in the past and in currently with national Black leaders, you know, from MLK to the late John Lewis, you know, what's his relationship been like with these uh, you know, marginalized tell you, leaders? Martin Luther King, unlike Farrakhan, understood that for the Black man to get somewhere in this country, it has to be done by building him up, not by tearing others down. Farrakhan did not understand that. Farrakhan believes you can build somebody up by ripping other people apart. Martin Luther King had nothing but, but love for the state of Israel. He was very close to the Jewish leadership. I remember when Martin Luther King was assassinated. I was, uh, I was just returning for swimming class back to my, my dorm room. And I, I felt that America was really in, in great trouble. Uh, it was the worst news I had heard in years. Uh, the only thing I heard that was worse was, was years earlier when, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. I said, my God, horrible, horrible. Uh, Martin Luther King did not subscribe to any of what Mr. Farrakhan said. And Jesse Jackson, 
uh, very quickly changed his mind because he understood that Farrakhan was divisive of people, not a uniter of people. And C. Jackson wanted to be a uniter of people. Um, others are afraid basically to criticize him, uh, but they don't like him uh, in certain cases, perhaps even for personal reasons, but most likely because they look at him as being divisive in nature, hateful in nature, hurtful in nature to the black cause. Uh, and many of them keep quiet about it because they're afraid of what may happen to them otherwise. There are plenty of, of, of people on the West Bank, even in, in Gaza, that would like to make peace with Israel, uh, but they better be quiet or they're gonna wind up with a bullet in their head the next morning, they're afraid. So there right. is fear of him. Right, right. Hey, Ari, can you hear me? Sure. Hey, Jusani. Just really quick, Joe, I had the opportunity, first of all, uh, just great job by Mr. Breibart. Um, there's nothing really to, to add just on this, that last question. Let me just say very quickly and get in and get out that in terms of Minister Farrakhan's relationship with the Black political community, this is one of the other things that uh, Mr. Breibart was referring to that has festered a great deal. I talk about it in my book. It's not a book plug, but I talk about it in my book how he regularly meets with members, for example, of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, there are people now who are very much powerful members of that caucus that uh, meet with him. He is still what I would call something of a kingmaker. There's that picture that came out uh, about a year or two after uh, uh, President Obama's uh, second term had ended. It was a 2005 picture of him standing with Louis Farrakhan and other members of the Congressional Black Caucus. So just in case anyone thinks that his influence is waning, it's not. He's 89 years old as formidable as forever, and he is still very much involved in Black democratic politics today. Right, and you know, Dumasani, a quick question in that regard. We saw two years ago his Criterion speech, uh, Puff Daddy uh, put him on Revolt TV and streamed it uh, to everyone in America. So, you know, I guess you even talk about that, you know, the relationship between him and some of the people in the entertainment industry. Yeah, so what you have there is is a, it's kind of a, a culmination of everything. Now he's an elder, he's almost 90 years old, right? He's an elder in the community and has been, has a long, long track record, which goes back to Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad was just as, as anti-Semitic and he taught this to Farrakhan, right? So what happens is that, yes, now the younger people, uh, my generation a little bit before that and everything, they see him as this elderly statesman, right? Who has been a pioneer, all of those things, even the things, for example, the fact that his involvement, his stated involvement in the assassination of Malcolm X, his, his own words that we took care of him the way you would take care of a traitor, they look past that completely. They're willing to, to ignore all of those things. And they see him as somebody, as a ring that they must kiss in order for them to have legitimacy in the community, which is exactly what Dr. King feared, uh, which is what actually came about. There's a vacuum that actually was created after the late 60s and the civil rights era, those types of things. So yes, so Puff, uh, the NFL players, right? Act, I mean, this is the, the there's, a, there's a list of those who are influencers who are more no problem with sharing his information, with uh, appearing with him because because that's the kind of status that he's been given, not just in the black community, but broader as well, right? Because the media doesn't touch it, right? What Mr. Breibart's saying, how many exposés do you see about it? They don't even discuss it, right? They leave it right. alone completely. Right. He's a part of progressive politics. He is a fixture on the left. Right, right. Um, so to go a couple more questions, I have, and Aaron, maybe you know this, why haven't Jewish leaders been willing to meet with him or have they even tried to resolve any of these uh, issues through dialogue or is that not even possible? I think the problem is that he has just gone too far. Uh, it's one thing when you criticize a policy. It's one thing when you criticize uh, political stands. Uh, but when you start attacking a person's core, his faith, uh, his background, uh, the land that, that bred his people essentially, uh, when you call them basically the, you know, the source of all evil in this country, when you make comments that are not only divisive, but comments that are outright lies, then it's very hard to assume that there's going to be any goodwill on the part of this individual. And you do need a certain amount of goodwill to be able to sit down and to discuss things. 
I don't know if Mr. Farrakhan, Reverend Farrakhan, would, would want to talk to Jews. I know he once tried to play a, uh, or he played a, a, a piece by Mendelssohn, uh, a violin piece, as, as an attempt at rapprochement. But I don't think any is possible at this point until you stop attacking the Jewish people for their religion, for and for being the source of all that was evil in the world. Right. That is the that is basically what Adolf Hitler said. You see anything wrong, you can be sure there's a Jew behind it. I believe Mr. Farrakhan says the same thing. Now, whether he believes it sincerely or not, I don't know. He's not a stupid person, but there is, is so much hatred in his heart towards Jews now. I think that really, uh, very hard to talk to such a person. There is no goodwill at all. Right. And and one more question here before we have to wrap up. Dumasani, maybe you can talk about this. Um, so the, the question is, does, does Louis Farrakhan really care about the Black community or more focus on this hatred of Jews? For instance, uh, there's the enslavement of African uh, Africans in the Arab world today, and he never talks about that sort of slavery but he, he only focuses on the Jews and the slave trade here. So, you know, does he even really care about the black community around the world? Ari, I don't know if that was, was that directed at me? I'm sorry, yeah. I got it wrong. Yeah. Okay, uh, so the answer to the question is, is <laughs> it's complicated. So no, does he care? Uh, well, that's once again, looking into his heart. I, I think that for him, uh, he sees, I would imagine he sees what he's doing as a good thing, but yes, that the slave trade uh, in the Arab Muslim world, which is 1400 years in counting, is the contradiction, not just Louis Farrakhan, but those of that ilk, who, black, white, whoever, right, who right. will attack the United States, attack Israel, attack, you know, all these injustices, but will completely ignore what's going on now. I talked about this before, there's a lot of parallels to Black Lives Matter, which is actually uh, again, you talk about Tamika Brown, like who's not so much a, a, one of the leaders, but the same mentality is where they will use some of the same rhetoric about Israel and it's a stealing land and this, that, and the other. And one of the things we talked about, just to just kind of illustrate that that contradiction, right? That Black Lives Matter, like Louis Farrakhan, is concerned about what's going on here, where the Black community is concerned, and will then involve itself in Middle East politics, would ignore the million slaves in Libya. Right, and the millions throughout, whether it's Mauritania, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, right. where you can see the clear contradiction. There's not a concern for the black community in the United States or Africans there in the region. So absolutely, it's one of those things and our organization points that out. We have been working, we'll continue to work with Charles Jakes, who's been doing amazing work in that, in terms of freeing the slaves that were in Sudan before, those types of things. So yes, this is one of, one of the areas that it's easiest to point out the contradiction is his concern. Let me say this part too, and Charles is aware of this. And of course, he even carries water for, he and Gaddafi were good friends. And before the slave trade that happened in Libya, blacks were treated less than third-class citizens in the first place, right? right? And he obfuscated what was going on with the Darfur region. He actually flew there, kicked it with his friend Bashir, came back and then went on radio and broadcast told everyone there is no slavery in Africa. So not only is he not concerned, he lied and told everyone there's no slavery there to cover his own you know, misdeeds, right? And continue to attack the Jews. This is how serious this is. Right, right. It almost reminds me of how uh, the anti-Israel movement is not interested in the suffering of the Palestinian people in Lebanon and that th they really are under living under apartheid there or when they were getting slaughtered in Syria. You know, their only concern is sort of hating Israel uh, and the Jewish people. Anyhow, uh, we are at time. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today um, and joining us for this uh, uh, Dispelling the Mist conversation. Next week, we were talking about Hezbollah. You're not going to want to miss that. There is a lot that most people do not know about Hezbollah, and we're going to really unpack that. So make sure to sign up for that conversation at ccfpeace.com. That's ccfpeace.com, where you can also donate to, and you can support our work. Um, we rely on donations to bring you these conversations. So uh, please consider donating. Um, we hope to see everyone in the future. Dumasani, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a privilege and honor. Take care. Bye-bye.